Hello, art historians, and welcome to our next lecture for this unit, where we're going to be moving out of the high Italian Renaissance and moving into the Venetian high Renaissance, which may be a little bit confusing considering we know that today Venice is in Italy, but hopefully I can clear that up for you. So before we move on, the first thing that I would like you to do is pause the video right here after I finish talking and see what similarities and differences you can see in this work on the left, which is high Italian Renaissance. It's actually Michelangelo. And on the right, we're looking at a work from the Venetian high Renaissance. So we're talking about a geographical distinction um, during this time period of the Renaissance. So just take a second and jot down similarities and differences between these two works before we move on to start explaining them. So let's establish a little bit of context. So when we're talking about Italy during this time, Italy is not yet what we consider to be Italy today. Um, there are a bunch of Italian city-states, but those aren't actually going to be united together until the 1800s. So these different city-states um, were very independent and very competitive with each other, and one of those is going to be Venice. And Venice prided itself on being a republic where they elected their leaders and they elected the people who represented them. And Venice was extremely wealthy. They were in kind of a boom time during this um, because Venice was very good at shipping. So in this time of expanded trade, Venice was kind of the place everybody went to. They held the monopoly really on shipping and you know having a port into the Mediterranean Sea. So Venice, because of this, um, is actually one of the places that's really gonna start using canvas as a medium for painting because they were very familiar with canvas using for sales so they just started and plus venice is very very humid so the the, the actual um canvas kept from curling up because before this they would paint a lot of the times on wood with oil paints and the wood would warp because of the humidity but the canvas could actually withstand that because it was meant to be waterproof because of sales now, because they are located towards the north, you can see that they are gonna have access to the Northern Renaissance as well. And they are gonna be huge proponents of using oil paints, which not everybody in Italy or Michelangelo or Raphael is going to be, but Venice, oil is gonna be the primary medium. And what that's gonna allow them to do is create textures, especially of skin, that seem to be very, very realistic and tactile. So color is gonna be a huge part of the Venetian Renaissance. Whereas in Italy, um, in the other Italian areas like Florence, it was more used to just color in um, rather than actually use it as the base. So this is to show you Venice. And you can see that Venice is actually um, an island essentially and made up of all these little canals that run through it. And it's a very unique and cool um, place to be. I'm just afraid that someday it's going to sink because you know global warming. So if you've ever heard of like the canals running through Venice and people riding through on the gondolas and you know, that's what you picture when you think of Venice because this was above all and anything else, a shipping city. Now, this is so important because when we talked about the high Italian Renaissance, we discussed that to them, it was about determining what was beautiful in terms of how to paint. And in Venice, it's almost a little bit different because they focused on what was beautiful to paint um, in terms of scenes and landscapes. So they could make those things beautiful, but it's almost like the content was more important than how it was actually made. So Venetian art during this time, like I mentioned, they're really on top of the world. Um, it's wealthy, the city is booming, um, everything's going great, it's peaceful. And works of art in Venice were really about enjoying life and this beauty uh, you know, that was in the world. And so in less of a focus on how things are painted, which definitely was a big deal in you know, Rome and Florence, but much more an emphasis on the beauty of life and what was being painted instead. Now we have to include, there's this big theory that Venice was cut off from classicism, that they weren't as exposed to the Greek and Roman classics as other places were. And that's entirely inaccurate. That's definitely not the case. They just chose not to outwardly. So mythology is still gonna be there but um, it's not gonna be as much of a focus as much as imagination was. So yeah, you'll have some artists who continue on that tradition of mythological scenes and you know things that you would see um, in the Greek and Roman stories, but it's also gonna start to be more about 
things that happened in history or philosophy or the beauty that was right there at the time and kind of drawing from the ideas of beauty and humanism, if not necessarily the Greek stories that were being told. So one of the things I like to say is that it's no place like Rome. Venice was not Rome or Florence in the way that they created art. They did, however, and this is important, keep those classical ideas of humanism. And like the artists of the high Italian Renaissance, they did focus on naturalism. But again, their idea of beauty is in terms of the content and how to make that look beautiful. And so, for example, in high Italian Renaissance, we see a lot of portraits where it's just the upper body, like the, the head and the shoulders of a figure. But Venice is going to do a lot with the entire body. And one thing that we do see a lot in Venice is they're not really beholden to the Pope as much as some other areas that are closer to the papal states. So they really didn't focus on religion as much. Now, it's still going to be there, but it really isn't as much of a focus to the Venetians. It's more about, and look at their city. I mean, it's all about enjoying life and sipping coffee by, you know, a waterway. I mean, it's about this life that was beautiful. And they like to show their cities because they are very wealthy. But another problem in Venice is they don't have, as you could see from the aerial view, a lot of landscapes. So they like to imagine landscapes and take influence from what they saw in Northern Europe because they don't really have that. So it's this imagining of what they would like to see since they don't actually have that in the city that they lived in. One important distinction is the fact that Florence and Rome, those artists were really focused on diseño, which is drawing. Like it should be first and foremost, you should be able to know how to draw like linear perspective and being those triangular compositions and how it is drawn. And then the color is added in. Venetian artists, because of that oil paint, worry much, much more about using color to create the actual image. They don't draw it first. They start with using the color to create the forms and the images. And that's a very big distinction for the Venetians. Another really important thing that I like to focus on is in Italy, like Rome and Florence, if you look at any of the backgrounds of any of Raphael's Madonnas or Da Vinci's Madonnas, it's almost like even the Mona Lisa, the background looks like, and I mentioned this before, when you go to like J.C. Penney's and you're like, okay, I want to pick out that background and that background. And then they just pull them down from like slides or almost like a set backdrop for a stage or a theater. But to the Venetians, the, the landscape is a huge part of the piece. Like it's just as important and needs to be a central part of the story because changing the landscape can change the meaning completely. So I do want to emphasize here this difference between color in Renaissance Italy versus Venice. And on the right is Venice. And what this artist would have done is not really drawn it out first. He would have started using the color as the way to create these shapes. Whereas on the other side, and you can see the backdrop I'm talking about here in Raphael's work, you can see that it's very much drawn and then colored in. Like the color was added to this instead of it just being like, the color is everything and how it's created. So this is a really important example. It's not one on the 250, but I do think it is noteworthy um, right here. This is called the Feast of the Gods in Venice. And it was created by, there's speculation on a couple different artists. Titian gets a little bit of credit for this one, um, taking over from one of his tutors. But this is the Feast of the Gods. And if you look at what's going on here, it's a scene called a Bacchanal. And a Bacchanal is basically a drunken revelry party and there's some pretty shady things that are going on in this scene it's people cutting loose and having a really good time and if you look over here on the far right this young lady is passed out and here is somebody who's approaching her in a way that's kind of suspect sorry my lights turned off so the idea kind of being that if you look here it's taking place and kind of blocked out by the mountains and it's blocked out by the trees and kind of hidden because that's an important part of the scene like this isn't something that you would want everybody watching or witnessing during this time so the landscape is important right so i'm going to kind of move on from there and again this is a bacchanal right which was pretty popular in venice for them to paint the bacchanals because life is beautiful and life is fun and 
this is what that shows from Greece. This is the ultimate picture of having a really good time. So this is actually um, another work called The Tempest, and this is by Giorgione. And you can see here, this is a very famous painting, but again, also not on the 250. And you can see right here that there is a young woman sitting here nursing her child. And off in the distance, there appears to be this approaching storm. And that is maybe the tempest that they're talking about that here approaches this dangerous storm. And you just want to yell in the, to the landscape where she's, she is, seek shelter, get out of there, you know, run um, to try to escape it. So the landscape is very much a part of this particular scene. All right, so kind of talked about that too. All right, so the artist that they picked for the 250 for the AP Art History exam is going to be Titian. And Vasari, who we've looked at, who did the lives of Michelangelo and Raphael and all these famous artists, he actually did do a um, lives of Titian. He wrote about Titian, who was Venetian. And um, he was a student of Bellini and Giorgione. And they've actually said that he far surpassed all of the um, artists that he taught, that he studied under. He was called the Sun Amidst All Stars. And Titian actually caught the attention of the Holy Roman Emperor at this time, whose name was Charles. And he was so impressed with what Titian could do as an artist that he hired him as his court painter. And there's this very famous story that at one point, um, Titian dropped a paintbrush while he was working. And Emperor Charles bent over and picked it up for him because that's how highly esteemed he actually viewed Titian in terms of talent. Um, and he was given a knighthood for this and a gold chain that he got from the, gold, the Holy Roman Emperor that he wears in all his self-portraits as a way to brag. And this is actually the portrait that he painted. And we know that because Charles V actually had a massive, huge chin. It was a family trait. So what he could do is, they said, make flesh appear to come to life with how he could paint it through his use of oils. And he really was obsessed with using red and black as a way to establish anything that he wanted to. Those are kind of like his two favorite colors. So this is Titian's self-portrait, a couple of them. And you can see here that Titian is wearing that gold chain that he got from um, the Holy Roman Emperor as a way to thank him for his talent because of how lifelike he made Charles appear. So this is one work um, by Titian that I just think really stands out on his mastery of color because it appears that this painting is lit up from a light source. But the only light source that's coming into this at the during this time is actually just from the windows. The painting and the use of the gold and the appearance of it and the use of red to guide your eye through it really show his mastery of what he could do with using color. And Michelangelo actually looked at Titian's work and was like, man, it's actually a pity this guy can't draw because he'd be a really good artist if he could because Michelangelo thought that to be a good artist, you needed to be able to draw first. But Titian put color first above everything. That's how he created his forms and his lines was through color, not through drawing or sketching first. So you can see here how this almost appears like backlit through the use of color, like the ascension of the Virgin you know, behind. So this is the Virgin Mary ascending into heaven. And you can see that it's almost like the colors behind it, like lighting it up without a light source. So this is just to show you again what, you see the lines aren't clear and drawn. They're made from color and they're blended together. And Titian would often use his fingers to kind of like blur the lines a little bit to make sure that it was the color that created the shapes and the forms and the people and not the lines. Um, now, one of the things that we're going to start to see happen during this time is actually in Venice, new genres that were developing. And remember, Venice is all about living the good life because they have the ability to do that. And we actually start to see the development of art that not only was it not religious, um, but it was actually almost a little bit erotic and suggestive and meant to um, engage the senses a little bit. I was like, for example, this is a goddess who saw that somebody was spying on her while she was bathing and she shot him with an arrow. I believe it was Athena, maybe, or Artemis. I believe it might have been Artemis and shot her, shot, shot her admirer with an arrow. 
And then her um, admirer started to turn into a tree because of that, because he had been caught spying on her. So this is a whole new genre of like, that had really never been developed before. Like there's not a religious purpose to it. It's not really a moral story. It's just kind of a story to be looked at almost. Which is why we have this work right here, which is called The Pastoral Concert by Giorgione, who Titian may or may not um, have actually worked on. So there is a major discussion here of what is happening. So it's called The Pastoral Concert, and this is blatant nudity for, it's not anything, it's female nudity for one, which is something that was generally not seen very often. Adam and Eve, could be shown nude because that's what they were. And then you would also sometimes get nude females whenever they were being banished or punished to hell or something like that. But this is a little bit different from that. And you can see the curves of the skin. It's not idealized. It's very naturalized in the female body. But what is the nudity about? Like there's two men here who are sitting here who are composing a concert. They're not engaging with the women who are sitting here. Um, so what they believe that this has to do with is because they seem to be kind of isolated, sitting on a hill far away from anybody who could see them, that's okay. But also the men aren't really acknowledging it, which means that these may be muses who are there to kind of um, inspire the gentlemen who are like inspire uh, the gentlemen who are composing. And that maybe because they were muses that they are nude so we're kind of seeing this progression of yes there's nudity but it's not really acknowledged it's kind of in secret nobody can really see them maybe they're muses so that would be mythology so that would make it okay kind of like the birth of venus um although this doesn't have really a religious christian meaning to it whatsoever and then giorgione progresses on to this to the sleeping venus and again it, this is not like the, F, the the birth of Venus where she's in the act of being born. So, of course, she would be nude. There's justification to the nudity. This is meant to be looked at because she has no clothing on. So here she is. She clearly has her dress here, which she has taken off. Her nudity is intentional. Um, she's far away from a home. But even this one was a little bit more acceptable because she's sleeping. She's not looking directly at you. It almost like looks at you as a person like, okay, why are you looking at her? Like not why is she naked, but why are you looking at her naked? Like, why are you standing here this long to question that she's naked? Like, what is your purpose for this? So, okay. Then it goes a little bit further. So one of the things that they wanted to point out is the fact that even in ancient Greece, it's never just nude. It's never just, you know, there because they're, they're naked, all right? There's almost always a reason why they're naked, and it represents some kind of message. Um, so, for example, in ancient Greece, the male nudes were meant to be strong and powerful and showing off their body while females were generally seen more as sexual objects meant to be looked at, passive, submissive, whatever. So in ancient Greece, if a female was shown nude, she was generally covering herself. It's almost like you caught her. Like, you know, she, she was bathing and you just happened to see her. And like even, you know, she's still modest about it, which is part of that. And generally not making eye contact with you. And then we get the Venus of Urbino. And the Venus of Urbino was actually written about um, as Titian's beast that he describes. And Mark Twain writes about it in his book, A Tramp Abroad. So basically a tramp, right, which we know what that means, abroad, overseas. And he goes and he sees this work of art that's there and that she's there for anybody to look at right, which is such a, such a great thing because there's been nudes before. So why did this get such a reaction? Like, why was this riling people up? Because nobody talks this way about Giorgione's Venus, Sleeping Venus, or Botticelli's Venus, but this one was meant to be looked at 
in her nudity. That is the focus of it. Um, in ancient Greece, it was still this idea of, you know, you you were seeing them naked, but it wasn't like advertised, basically. This piece of art is going to be quite a bit different. And this is the work of art that we're talking about, which is the Venus of Urbino. And you can imagine that this kind of riled everybody up because she's not taking a bath. There are no clothes nearby. Um, she's just laying there in her nakedness, which is all, and she's looking right at you, which had never really been done before. She's almost daring you to look at her. Like she's saying, look at me because I'm naked as a result of this, because her nudity was part of it. And you can see that Titian uses the color that he does to draw attention to her fertility, essentially, and that the white, you know, helps to almost create like a reflection on her soft skin, like to kind of show like, this is how skin actually looks. It looks very supple. He used the oils to create that. And she's put in a bedroom. Like it changes everything completely. Like there's only a couple reasons why she would be naked in a room. So you have here a couple things going on. She is staring at you. She has the red and the green and the white to further accentuate the fact that she's nude. Over here in the background is a young child digging through a chest that she had brought to this home. And she has a dress to dress her. Um, she's picked out a dress. So it's not like she had clothes on and is now putting them on. Like, no, she was naked when this happened. So Giorgione's Venus did not get quite the response that Titian's Venus did. And it may be because of the fact that over here on the left, the nudity was just natural. It was part of the scene. And her eyes are closed. She's still modest. Um, she's not there. It's kind of like still that Greek idea of, okay, she's covering up. It's you know not like we, we walked in on her. Whereas the one on the right was more like she's looking at you, she's acknowledging her nudity, and she knows that you're looking at her. And she's almost daring you to look at her. So one of the things, again, if you notice, the green line in the background of the curtain draws attention to her most important attribute as a wife. And the reason why that would be accentuated is the fact that and this is a terrible story, is the fact that the Duke who commissioned this may have been commissioning this work of art as almost a reminder slash teaching tool for a young bride who he was engaged to whenever she was 10 years old, which means they would have been married probably about the time she was 12 or 13. And this would have really stated what her marital expectations were. And that was to obviously provide children for her husband. And because he used this oil paint instead of drawing it out first, the color that he uses just brings her skin to life. Like it is areas where it's reflected on it, where it's fleshier than others. Um, and it really makes that stand out that she is, it's not like a marble statue. It's a fleshy person. Um, and nudes could be okay Typically, if it was, so where before have we ever seen a nude woman who wasn't a goddess? So you would see like Venus or Aphrodite or whatever, but this isn't Venus. This is the Venus of Urbino, which means she's a woman of beauty in Urbino. She's not a fake person. So by putting the word Venus on there, that could justify the nudity, but nothing else about this makes her a goddess. So like the sleeping Venus on Giorgione's work, that's a sleeping goddess who her nudity represents, you know, her feminine side, her beauty, um, and still covered and kind of like you're catching her naked. This is, nope, almost an invitation to look at her. And one of the things that gives credence to the fact that this was a marital aid is the fact that the dog on the edge of the bed represents loyalty, like a reminder of this is what it's for. And then 
on the background, if she was a true goddess, true goddess, she wouldn't need clothing. But here in the background, they're picking her out clothing, which leads to more of that idea that she's not a goddess. She's a real woman, and they're getting clothes for her out of her marriage chest. She's holding roses, um, which would be a symbol of love and beauty. And then there's a young child in the background, which could represent the fact that she's supposed to provide children. Now, Titian chose to do this portrait in this way, um, and it shook everybody up. Like, it's not like we've seen goddesses in the past where they're not making eye contact. Their nudity seems to be justified, like getting out of the bath or, you know, um, getting into water or just being born or like with Adam and Eve who were naked because of sin. No, this is just nudity and it's considered to be beautiful. Like it's a beautiful goddess who is nude, but she's not really a goddess and she's looking right at you. Right. So one of the things that, um, Titian deliberately did for this, maybe because he he didn't really like what the painting was for. There's kind of some discrepancy on that. But he split the scene into two halves. So if you go back, you'll see there's one area and then there's an open curtain, like almost like that's her bed curtain there. And he almost challenges you. Like, are you looking at her as a work of art or a goddess? Or are you looking at her as a naked woman? All right, so um, it kind of is showing during this time in Venice a little bit of this idea of female empowerment also because she's looking at you. She's challenging you. She doesn't really, is she encouraging you to look or is she blocking you? All right, so almost, again, this idea with Titian of, hey, um, you're looking. So just so you know, like you're going to judge her for being naked, but you're looking at her. So just kind of, you know, think about that. Don't judge, all right? Now, one thing that we can see happen, unfortunately, um, Titian, he lost his wife, and later on in life, he started to develop a tremble in his hand and very poor eyesight. So later on in his life, we can see the colors that he does really start to fade and not be nearly as clear um, and it could be he was painting a little bit more emotionally, but also because he was deteriorating as a human. Um, but either way, you can see that his focus was definitely the use of color to help convey the importance and the beauty, especially the way he captures her skin and even the blush that's on her cheek and like the blood underneath her skin, which again is significant because she's fleshy. She's not marble. She's not a goddess. She has blood running through her veins. She's a flesh and blood woman. I just thought this was kind of cool because Zarathustra makes an appearance. Okay, so one of the things that um, we've commonly discussed in this particular painting is in the age of the Me Too movement, um, there has been discussions if paintings like this one um, of the Venus of Urbino should actually be displayed anymore, especially in the context of the fact that it may have been a marital aid for a very young Girl. So there's discussion of works of art of artists like um, Gauguin, who we will talk about, and Titian, where it's this idea of should these works of art be taken down? Should they be displayed if they show women like this? And Titian has been a man of a lot of discussion when it comes to this, because it's hard to figure out if he's painting this woman as a strong woman who is engaging you, like almost questioning you, what are you looking at? So yes, I'm naked, but hello, you're standing here looking at me. Um, is he a tribute? Is he tributing these works to people that he's found beautiful? Or is he dishonoring them as sexual objects? So it's really hard to know because we don't have that information firsthand. But it is a very important discussion that people are having in terms of art history of what works of art from the past should still be displayed in the context of current times. And we'll further discuss this more when we look at Olympia by Manet later on.